Good morning. Let's just hang out here for a minute and give a few more people to uh, tune in on their computers to see what's going on this morning. Hope everybody's enjoying NARCON 2021 so far. I've certainly found it interesting, exciting, and informative. Good thing to do this weekend because in the Dallas area, it's uh, been very rainy, thunder showers, windy, all that kind of good stuff. It's a nice day to be able to sit inside and hang out on the computer uh, and see some very interesting presentations. So again, we're just going to wait about another minute or so, let people uh, get tuned in, and we'll get this program started. All right, just a little bit of an introduction here. Uh, my name's Dave Schaefer. Welcome to my humble little model shop. We're all lucky to have this great hobby of ours. Uh, when the pandemic hit and I was told that I had to stay at home in quarantine, I kind of looked around the shop and thought, you know, yeah, I, I can do that. I, I can, I think I can live uh, in, in, in be stuck at home for a little while. That'll work for me. So let's talk about a methodology for doing something really different. By getting away from our usual three and four nose cone fin rockets, we should be able to do this with some degree of confidence with the techniques that I'm about to show you. Um, we'll discuss what works, what doesn't, and how to avoid some of the pitfalls. Hang on for a second. I'm getting a message here I just need to check on. Yeah, okay. Uh, anyway, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A portion of the, the uh, chat box or in, in the Q&A portion of your uh, app here. Uh, the chat box is used to communicate back and forth amongst yourselves uh, during my presentation. If you are attending my session and you are also a speaker, uh, please make sure that your microphone is on mute because you do have the potential to ruin it for everybody else. With that, let's go ahead and get started and uh, uh, see if we can have some fun with this. Give me a second just to get uh, things off and running. All right, so what we're gonna talk about today is getting unusual high power rockets to fly. And just a little bit about myself, in addition to flying model rockets as well, kind, shapes and sizes, I enjoy everything from quarter A's up to M and N powered rockets. Uh, I also fly radio control jets, uh, propeller driven airplanes of all kinds, helicopters. Uh, in 2017, I was the AMA national champion in intermediate precision acrobatics. Professionally, I work as an FAR 107 UAS pilot for UTD, flying a variety of platforms, both fixed wing and rotary wing. In addition to that, I'm also a corporate pilot and fly a variety of corporate jets. Uh, just a little bit of legal stuff here to get started. Uh, be safe. Part of what I'll be suggesting is the possibility of testing small model rockets potentially to their destruction. It is your responsibility to do this in a proper venue with few spectators at safe distance to ensure no one gets hurt. Again, develop a safety plan to do this and, and uh, follow your safety plan. You can see here's, here's a nice shot of some of the projects that I've done in the back. Uh, all of these rockets have a couple things in common. They're all asymmetric and they all can be very difficult to model in any kind of simulation program, either rock sim or open rocket. And that makes it challenging if you want to fly something like this successfully. So we're going to start off by talking about the limitations of simulations. Sims may not handle unusual shapes well or at all. Uh, they don't handle changes in center of pressure with changes in angle of attack. Simulations are also black and white, or they may come up with a statement like marginal. Uh, we may uh, also be looking for other challenging specific flight characteristics as well. Uh, so you can fly something like this. And this is a 10 foot long, five foot across, 65 pound model of the uh, X-30. You want to be able to uh, approach the pad and be able to have some reasonable degree of confidence that this actually might be successful. Uh, using small data models to test and gather data is really what I'm going to be talking about today, and that's really the a, a great way to do this. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, using small test models really 
can provide a lot of data and find out some unusual flight characteristics, which we're going to discuss here in a second. Uh, on this particular slide, this was taken to Frontiers of Flight Museum at the at Dallas Love Field. You can see that large 10 foot long X-30 where my cursor is here. And you can see some of the flight test models that we had on the bottom. Yeah. Okay, so you can see some of the small models that we had on the bottom. Start with this small balsa model. Uh, this was actually built in a hotel room on a uh, snowy, wintry day. Uh, it, it started its flight test testing by being tossed across the hotel room onto the bed. And I was able to make some trim adjustments and adjust the center of gravity to get a reasonable flight across the room onto the bed. Later, a dowel pin was added to the top uh, with a standoff that was flown on a super big Bertha that would boost it up to about four or 500 feet and cut it loose. And it really glided very well. So I, we started with some limited flight test data with a small falsehood test model. Uh, from that, we progressed and built three of these about 33% scale larger test models. Two of those were boost test only. Um, and then the one that you actually see on the table there, and, the, and you'll also see it on my table once we get out of the PowerPoint presentation, that was actually a glide only model. That was released from a large radio control airplane and was glided to a landing. This model that you see here in the back, which is our 25% scale model, or at least it was supposed to be a 25% scale model, um, was the one that flew the full profile. It would boost up on a rocket motor, we transition to a glide, come around for a landing. Uh, with this 25% scale model, we got the great bulk of our flight test data. All these other two models led to be, gave me the data that I needed to fly the 25% <clears throat> scale model. Uh, and, you know, each flight we uh, refine the control surface throws, we move the center of gravity back because the only way we were going to find out how far back was too far was actually to test it till it didn't fly properly. And that's exactly what we did. And as you can see here, it did survive that test. Uh, having said that, I can't emphasize the importance of good mathematics and scaling. Uh, here of our building of the large X-30 that I've been discussing here. On the left side is the late Bob Wilson, myself, and on the right side, Brian Nelson. Great group of guys to work with, a really, really fun project. So here's a picture uh, on that was taken on July 12th, 2002 of this large X-30 taking off on an Aerotech L850. Uh, great looking boost. I love white lightning motors, lots of fire and smoke. They, they always look wonderful in flight. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, they're a lousy choice for rocket gliders that I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, but I, I use them all the time. I, I just, I'm a sucker for these things. So the X-30 boosted very nicely. And when I got to the top of the boost and transitioned to the glide, went to the glide trim, uh, much to my surprise and dismay, it rolled and snap rolled inverted. Uh, I did recover from that and pitch forward a little bit and then started to snarl, stall and snap roll again. Uh, and this made me believe, correctly so, that our CG was too far aft. Uh, so I started to accelerate the model. Uh, as I started to accelerate, the flight controls got very hard to handle because the servos that we were using were too weak. But I did find a narrow envelope between stalling and too fast that I could fly the model. Unfortunately, we had the smoke from that great white lightning motor float right over the top of my head, obscuring, obscuring my view, making it tough to see, but it did blow by and I was able to recover from that. But you can see in this bottom right-hand picture here where my cursor is, that my landing attitude was not exactly what I was looking for. And this was the result of the touchdown. Uh, you can see uh, you know, on the far right side there, uh, Brian Nelson, Tommy Bishop looking like the first day of deer season. Yeah, we had a successful hunt. We really killed that thing. On the left side, you can see Russell Link, uh, this guy second from the left is Phil Eaton looking down, kind of wondering, you know, where, where did we go wrong on the math? So as bad as this looks, it only took me about four hours to do the physical repair, another hour and a half to install larger servos on it. We discussed the uh, issues with the smoke and uh, decided that we're going to use an animal L1060 Green Gorilla motor, which is a very low smoke motor, which would prevent us from getting obscured by the smoke. And, and Phil did locate our math error. As it turns out that my 25% scale model was actually a 24% scale model. That created a one quarter inch error in our center of gravity calculations. Therefore, our CG, when the first time we flew the large X-30, was a quarter inch behind where it needed to be. So for the next flight, we moved it forward three eighths of an inch. And as you can see, it had a great boost. The glide worked out very well. 
I do apologize for the lousy image, but this was the state of the art in digital photography back in 2002. And you can see that uh, today that the X30 model is uh, alive and very well. This is at the hangar at Exos Aerospace in Cattle Mills, Texas. A few more of the members of the X30 team with me on the far left, Russell Blink, myself, Philly, and Tommy Bishop there on the right. This whole project, the concept for this project was the brainchild of Philly and Tommy uh, Bishop. Uh, they originally were going to do the thing, parachute recovery, and then thought, gee, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually make this thing glide? And that's when they enlisted my help. Wonderful experience. A great group of guys to work with. And, and uh, it was fun. It was fun to work. We, we did have our problems, but it was fun to work through the problems, even more fun to resolve them and get the thing to work right. Okay, well, let's talk about another interesting little project. Again, like the other projects I discussed, uh, this is a uh, asymmetric. Uh, this was the brainchild of Jason Ware, the gentleman standing on the right. This is an M-powered 67-pound Battlestar Galactica Colonial Viper. And this offers all kinds of challenges, particularly when you're trying to get any data from simulations. You can see it's asymmetric, that the fins aren't the same. The vertical stabilizer is different than the other two fins. The fins aren't exactly 120 degrees apart. It's got engine tubes on the side of it. It's got a canopy. It's got some weapon pods. It's got a slice cut nose cone. So as we started to build this thing, we started to realize that it was developing a tremendous amount of mass in the back, which would have to be compensated by a lot of weight up front, combined with the fact that we really had very, very little room in this upper section to par pack parachutes. Uh, most of you are familiar that, you know, the larger the parachute you pack in a very limited space, the less chance that you have of deploying it successfully. So we wanted a big enough chute that would come down softly, but not so big that we would run into deployment problems. And the way we could we could work with that is to find out how much weight we could take out of the nose of this thing and still get it to fly successfully. Uh, Jason built an e-powered model of this that we flew several times. In one of the, the in, each time we removed more and more nose weight out of it to see how far back we could go. One of the things that we did discover during a lot of those flights that at every time it flew, it would pitch toward the canopy 15 degrees. It would always take that 15 degree arc toward the canopy. And we made up for this by tilting the launch rail 12 or 15 degrees uh, toward the belly, and then it would come off and put up a perfectly straight flight every time. So the first time we flew the large uh, Viper, we did exactly that. Now, we weren't uh, supremely confident that it would do the exact same thing, so we decided to split the difference. So in this particular picture, you can see that the rail is tilted about eight or nine degrees to the left, and that the model came off the rail and still went another uh, six, seven degrees to the right. And from there, it put up a wonderfully beautiful straight flight, uh, and, and we're very happy with it. Had we not tilted the rail, it would have come off there, taken a 15-degree arc to the right it's, as a reference in this picture and the flight may not have worked out so well. So some of you may be thinking, well, you could put spin tabs on something like that to get the spin rapidly to null out any pitching like that. Keep in mind on this particular model that that pitching was only happening if right off it came off the rail after that went perfectly straight. But, but think about this, a rapidly spinning space shuttle or something like an orbital transport or something like this Viper spinning rapidly uh, may not be very convincing during boost. It may not be what you're looking for. Again, this was found out by using a small scale model. Okay, a few things that, and one of the reasons small scale models work so well is you can always scale up, but you can't scale down. And it's because of this nasty little thing called Reynolds number that I'm gonna address here in a second. Uh, this was a nice picture during LDRS in 2006. Uh, I just wanted to send a picture home to my wife and say, hey honey, we're having a wonderful time at LDRS. I don't want you worrying about us. We're, we're, we're really having a good time. So let's talk about Reynolds number just a little bit. Uh, here's the math for it, for those of you uh, engineering types. But the, the bottom line here, and to simplify it all, that you cannot scale air molecules. We can scale our models up and down great, but, but you can't scale the air molecules. And this is probably better addressed in these bullet points. If you want, just take a quick look at those and see what they say. And again, the bottom line is, is you know, air molecules don't scale. But for us, taking a small model, scaling it up works fantastic. If it worked on the little model, it's definitely going to work on the big model. All right. Now, for those of you who want to take that next step and you, you want to take that step beyond having your rocket come down unceremoniously under a parachute, let's talk about getting something to glide. So here's a picture of an Estes Falcon one of the classic old uh, boost gliders, great design, still flies very well today. 
and it optimizes what you want. It has the weight forward for boost and a forward CG for boost, spits the motor, the weight and the CG moves as for glide to give you the optimum performance. None of the projects that I'm going to talk about today have that configuration. They all have the motor in the back, therefore that the CG is aft for boost and moves forward for glide, which is the most undesirable thing that we want. So the question is, how do we mitigate these issues? How do we, how do we make that work if it's exactly backwards for what we want? So on my large X2 project, which I'm going to talk about here a little bit, this is an engineering drawing showing the stability margin on this particular model. Now, this one was 11 and a half inches in diameter. And keep in mind that if you're just boosting a regular rocket that's over eight foot tall, 11 inches in diameter, uh, you may be able to have an 18 inch stability margin in there that would work just fine for you. But if you want to make the glide, things are going to be a little bit challenging. So on this particular diagram, we're showing a red line that's roughly 22.25 inches aft of the apex of the leading edge of the wing. Now, that's just an arbitrary point. We refer to that in engineering as a datum point, which is an arbitrary point anywhere on the model. I'm going to address this a little bit more here later. Uh, uh, but let's not make it complicated. We can pick this anywhere on the model. It's just a place that we're taking measurements from. The blue line forward of that is my potentially my forward CG limit for controllability and pitch during the glide. And you can see that's 1908 inches, giving me roughly three inches of center of gravity margin to work with. But taking our lessons from the X30 project, we want to have uh, a forward C or an FCG that has a degree of margin for safety. So here we have a 5% margin in front of the uh, red line is a blue line, which is my minimum. Uh, I'm going to refer to as a safe FCG limit, which moves it up almost an inch. Uh, but that still leaves me a little over two inches to work as a center of gravity margin. So there's several ways that, that I can accomplish making this thing glide. I could have releasable weight up front, perhaps water ballast or another ejectable weight. I can have a weight in the, in the machine itself that's designed to shift, or I can work within the margin of uh, center of gravity limits, and that's what I choose to do on my projects, just to keep things simple. So how's the math work out for this? Well, this is a, a little bit of mathematics done by my good friend, Mike Ozer, who I'll talk about here later. Uh, he ran this weight and balance statement for me. And one thing I just want to point out here, motor tube to him is the hardware for us. So that's the motor casing and all the closures and all that kind of stuff. And you can see the weight buildup of the, the vehicle, the moments, which is basically where those measurements are taken on the model. And then again, giving us a total weight with the total moment, which gives us a CG. Now, this is a negative number in this case because we decided to move our datum point somewhere closer to the center of gravity just to make life easier. And this is in front of a bulkhead that's inside the model. Uh, so that's the reference. So this is showing how far in front of that bulkhead it is, which happens to be at the center of gravity. When we did our fuel burn and we took roughly three pounds of propellant out of the back of it, it changed our uh, weight, it changed our moment, therefore our CG, and you can see that the CG moved forward just a little under two inches, which was, even though I lost three pounds from the back of this thing, was well within my center of gravity envelope. And just an interesting point that I'd like to make is that I looked at a variety of motors of this thing, and I'm going to talk about choosing motors here in a second, but I looked at 75 millimeter motors, and I looked at long 54 millimeter motors, and as it turns out, because the, the center of mass of a long 54 millimeter motor is much further forward, it minimized my CG change during propellant burn. And that's one of the reasons I picked a long 54 for this project as opposed to a short fat 75. So testing. So, so we had all our theory and all of our simulations and we decided to do some testing. And the testing actually started with a very simple model that looked like this. Talk more about this model a little bit later. But basically, I took over a dozen flights with this model, moving the center of gravity aft, moving it forward, uh, adjusting control throws. We also uh, uh, did some experiments with auto stabilization, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. But this verified our sim data. Now, one of the things that the simulations did not show that this showed was when the center of gravity was forward on the model, and it was at a slow speed, I was losing pitch authority and may not have enough pitch authority to flare to my pleasure. So I was able to overcome this and experiment on this model with a neat little thing I like to call pitch boost for lack of a better term. But because of the highly swept wings of the X2, I could actually move the ailerons up with the elevator, which increased my pitch authority and found that this worked marvelously on this little model 
and solved one of the big problems that potentially I could have had when I went to make my large model. Uh, this is a picture of the bottom of the wing of the X2. Uh, the uh, back of the model is toward the bottom of the frame. The front of the model is toward the top. And it's showing some marks here. In the two bottom marks there are my ultimate FCG limit. Anything behind that is unstable. Uh, you see that little margin in the middle there? That is my 5% my margin, which brings me to the forward line, which was my, my FCG limit, considering the 5% stability margin. Uh, every time this flew, uh, the balance was checked prior to flight to make sure that I was not aft of those marks. Okay, back when I talked about the X30 a little bit, I mentioned that my servos were too small. Back then, powerful servos were not as popular as they are now or available as they are now. So it's very hard to get servos that were up to the job, uh, although we did find some and did make it work. But here's a neat little servo torque calculator that I found online. Uh, I did have a, um, a link to uh, uh, some videos in some websites. Uh, should be available on this Narcon 2021 website somewhere. I haven't tried to look for it yet, uh, but you should be able to find this. And this is a great way to calculate whether your servos are up to the job. So we've talked about a methodology of making things work, uh, which brings me to this little model, uh, which I built for uh, Balls 2016. Uh, work and family obligations made this a very rush project. It's put together rapidly. Uh, didn't have time to make a small model. I was very comfortable with this uh, data that we got at for the X2 and my ME163, which I'll talk about here in a minute, uh, and decided that I'd be okay by not making a, a model for this. And on the way driving out to Balls, the group of us discussed, you know, Balls is about one thing for those of you who haven't been to Balls, and that is that you want that great liftoff picture. You want that model looking just fantastic if it leaves the pad. After that, everything else is just icing on the cake, but that's your goal. You want the great takeoff picture. And certainly in, in that regard, I, I did exceedingly well here. Here's a great picture of that X-15 boosting off the pad. Again, an X-15 Delta. When I got to Apogee, though, uh, I found out I was having a little problem in the glide. Uh, my center of gravity was too forward. And you can see the glide attitude is, let's just say, less than optimum, which resulted in a touchdown attitude, which was a little less than optimum. And the net result was something that looks like this. Now, as bad as that picture looks, and yeah, it, it looks bad, uh, I'm pleased to say that the great bulk of that black cloud that you see is the paint flying off of my polypropylene nose cone as it's turning into accordion. accordion. The uh, airframe itself really didn't do too bad on damage, and hence it's been repaired and will fly again. All right, so I want to talk about an important thing that I like to call the Goldilocks boost. Uh, not too fast, not too slow, not too high, not too low. It is very important that we come off the rail with enough energy to have good control of the model. Uh, at the same time, we want to have a nice boost, again, that's going to uh, not be subject to crosswinds or gusts and have a nice straight boost. But by the same token, we don't want to overstress the airframe and we don't want to boost out of sight. Having said that, the reverse is, is equally as bad, if not worse. Uh, coming off the rail uh, lethargically, you won't have control of it. You'll be a victim to the elements. Uh, boosting too low is not going to have a, give you transition, uh, a chance to transition into a glide or get uh, trimmed up for landing. A few little things here. So, so how do we accomplish uh, or what kind of motors do we use to get, get that Goldilocks boost? And I found that. Progressive or dual thrust motors work exceptionally well. This is the uh, Gorilla K470 that was flown in the uh, X2. You can see the thrust in pounds on the left side, the course of the time in seconds on the bottom. 225 pounds of thrust on a 46 pound model accelerates it pretty nicely off the rail. And you can see that nice regressive burn, which continued to give me a good boost, but prevent having any structural failures during that boost. Now, so how do I pick motors for my rocket gliders? And that's really a very challenging thing, and I spent hours going over motor data to do that. I talked about before the limitations of simulations, but here's where the simulator is great. So this, this is my model for an X2 that was modeled in open rocket. It doesn't look anything like my X2, but the beauty of it is that the weight in the drag profile is almost identical of it. So the information that I got from the simulation about uh, maximum velocity, speed off the rail, altitude, 
were all remarkably accurate when I got my telemetry back from the X2. And really works out very well. An important point to make here is keep in mind, we talked about that narrow center gravity envelope. So every time I change a motor here, if I put a larger motor back here, I have to put more weight up here. If I try a smaller motor, I have to take weight out. So I have to continually do my center of gravity calculations to get my total weight to be accurate, to get any of the data that I'm getting out of this thing to be accurate. But I've found in some of my projects that using a simulator this way works extremely well. One thing I will point out is that if you, as you go with a larger motor, you're adding more weight to the front, to get into diminishing returns in terms of how high you're gonna go for the impulse that you're imparting on the vehicle. Auto stabilization and telemetry. These are really potential game changers. Uh, start with the telemetry first. Uh, during the flight of the X2, I had uh, re uh, altitude and airspeed information in real time, and I had somebody reading that out to me. Uh, additional things are GPS uh, information. You can have attitude information. There's a lot of stuff that can come down from telemetry these days. The picture that we have here is a little thing called an Eagle Tree Guardian. It's about a $65, $70 auto stabilization device. It is capable of uh, handling all three axis of any kind of rocket or airplane. In the X2, I used it in roll control only. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that here in a second. Uh, it basically has three modes. I can turn it on the transmitter. I have a switch, I can turn it off. I could turn it on for purpose of simplicity. I'm gonna call it auto upright mode. Any time that I, I let go of the control stick, it would roll the model upright. Even if it was inverted or in some really wild attitude, it would roll it back upright. The other one I'm going to call roll hole mode, and that's what I flew. And basically, when I roll into a 45-degree bank turn and let go of the stick, it, the model will stay in that 45-degree bank turn, which is exactly the way my precision aerobatic airplanes fly, so it had a very natural feel to me. The reason this was used in roll only on the X2 is because a glider properly set up and balanced will seek its own attitude, pitch attitude uh, during glide. So I didn't want this particular device interfering with that. We did do some very serious testing with this thing. As I mentioned, I tested on the small X2 model, but we also tested this on an N to M two-stage rocket. And this is Ken Overton's N to M two-stage showing the uh, upper payload compartment with the Guardian in it and some very small canards uh, to adjust the trajectory of the flight. Ken in particular was having a problem because his, <clears throat> his motors, which were long burn, didn't have a high kick coming off the pad, resulting in some leaning of the rocket coming off the rail after boost. When this particular picture was taken, right after it left the rail, it did about 12 degrees to the left as far as uh, our perspective was taken. As, as the speed of the rocket picked up, it leveled it out in about 1,200 feet, put it up, uh, turned it into a perfectly straight trajectory. Uh, you can barely see in this picture these tiny little canards at the top of it. Uh, and the good news for me, it really is a great demonstration just how well very inexpensive systems like this can work. Unfortunately for Ken, it exceeded his limits and triggered his uh, abort for the ignition of the upper stage. So he didn't get the two-stage flight he wanted. He did recover all the parts successfully. But for me, it was just a wonderful demonstration of the capabilities of a piece of equipment like this. Proper venues. Not all launch sites are good places to fly large radio control rocket gliders. So kind of keep that in mind. Most of the people who are used to running the range are not familiar with what you're about to do if you're flying a large rocket glider for this. So they really don't understand what's required for safety. So please take the time to educate all those involved. I want to inject here one other thought, and that is if you're flying something really interesting and different, and this is what this whole section session is about, you know, you may want to contact the launch coordinator a couple weeks in advance and say, hey, you know, I'd like to come out to your launch. This is what I'm thinking about flying. Uh, let's talk about whether this is doable or not. Uh, I think it's a little unfair to a launch director if, if somebody shows up on the day of the launch or something really wild and out there and say, hey, I got this crazy project. I want to launch it at your launch. So, you know, it, it, it always helps to to do things in advance. If you get out to a launch site and you don't feel that you can fly your project safely, considering the range setup or the personnel or just the way the venue is itself, don't fly, save it for another day. Coordinate with the uh, LCO and RSO during launching. Here's a screenshot from the video that was on the Discovery Channel of my X30 taken off. 
The reason this is a screenshot is there are no stills of my X30 taken off. And the reason for that is they did the countdown, they got to zero, uh, they pushed the button and absolutely nothing happened. Five seconds later, nothing. 10 seconds later, nothing. 15 seconds later, nothing. I turned to uh, my spotter, Brian Nelson, and I said, hey, you know, we need to learn more about these hybrids. We're not having luck. And at about that point, somebody at the LCO table saw what the LCO was doing and said, hey, you need to push both the ignition and the gas button, oxygen button at the same time. And he did, which was about 30 seconds after he said, said zero. And this took off with my back turned to it. Uh, not the way I like to start a rocket glider flight, but it did work out. It's very important during a high power launch that you keep your landing zone clear. This is a wonderful picture of my ME-163, this great flying rocket. I love flying this thing. Anyway, uh, during this particular flight, Gerald News, the president of the Tripoli Rocketry Association, was flying this. Gerald is an avid RCer, in addition to him building some really cool rockets. Anyway, I was uh, spotting for him. But in addition to spotting, I'm instructing him on how to fly the ME-163, discussing the finer point of its handling characteristics, particularly during landing. And I failed to recognize that Neil from Rockets Magazine was walking right out into the middle of our landing zone. And of course, he came into view. Gerald had to dodge him uh, just prior to landing. Uh, Neil really should have known better not to walk out there. But in reality, as a Gerald spotter, I should be making sure that his landing zone is clear. And if it's not, advising him of otherwise. You also want to make sure that the LCO and RSO need to make sure that the landing zone is clear. All right, so we talked about a nice methodology for doing some unique things. And I really want to talk about uh, things I've learned over the years. And it all really came together on this project. And this is a one first scale Bell X-2. The X-2 is the first aircraft to exceed Mach 3, and it went to 126,200 feet. That's a record that's still held today because to this date, there has been no other heavier than air man carried aircraft that's reached that altitude without reaction flight controls. Uh, this was rocket powered planes before they decided to put reaction controls on them. Unfortunately, two of the four pilots who flew it got killed. I would encourage everybody to go online, just look at the history of the X 2. Really very interesting. This aircraft was designed before uh, Chuck Yeager broke the speed of sound in 1946. So it was really designed before we knew a lot about high speed flight. Uh, very interesting program, but it really did set up, in, in the lessons learned from it, did set up the very successful X-15 program. Uh, enlisted the help of a good friend of mine, Mike Ozer. Mike is uh, in my RC modeling club. Uh, he is uh, a remarkable engineer, and he did all the engineering and CAD work, picked the airfoils that we're gonna use on the X-2 for this project. Uh, my success with this was a large part of his work. But he started with a CAD drawing looked like this. Uh, we started entering in the structure of the model. Uh, for those of you who build model airplanes or built perhaps, perhaps built a Comet or Golos rubber band kit, very standard model airplane construction, nothing unusual here. A little bit of use of carbon fiber, but nothing really out there. I can see a little bit of the tail structure, canopy cockpit area. So I took Mike's great drawings. And I actually had to put the thing together. And here you can see the, the X2 starting to come together. The first half of the fuselage had been built. Uh, here I'm putting the second half into position, uh, really starting to come together. Here's with all the stringers added, starting to get the sheeting on it. Here's the compute, completed fuselage of the X2, uh, really starting to come together. The wing construction, again, very standard RC construction, foam core, hardwood spars. Uh, very light, but very strong. Here the X-2 is really starting to look like an X-plane covered in fiberglass cloth. Just I want you to see the bottom of this. One of the techniques that I use for building these things, particularly some unusual shapes, is this blue foam, or sometimes it's pink foam. doesn't matter, but it cuts easy, carves easy, stands well. Great, very inexpensive uh, material for building models. So just two weeks prior to balls, here's a picture taken. This is my good friend Ken Overton on the left, myself on the right. You can see I have a long way to go to get the X2 done. But the good news at this point is all of our flight testing was done. All of our data was collected. I could continue forward with confidence that this thing would fly reasonably well. Of course, here is the picture of the second flight of the X2. It uh, balls in 2014. The first flight was in 2013. The reason I picked these, the picture of the second flight is on the first flight, it was overcast skies. Uh, in, in, 
it performed very well. I, I was thrilled with, after the first flight. It did exactly everything we wanted to do, uh, but the pictures were less than ideal because of the weather wasn't so great. The second time I flew it, the wind was calm, the skies were clear. Put up a, just a great flight. You can just see how wonderful these skies look on this. The X2 looking just fantastic on its way up. The glide performance was everything that we uh, had hoped for. Uh, Mike Ozer's calculations were spot on, which was verified with the small model. So to get to this point, uh, having the small model and gathering data from that was invaluable. Now here I am coming for landing. The nose fairing has been ejected just like the full size X2 and the nose gear is extended, the skids are extended. And if you take a really good look, you can see right here that you can see that that aileron is up as well as the elevator and that's that pitch boost that I'm talking about <clears throat> that was discovered on the small model. So I was getting ready to take the third flight of the X2, and I got a call from George Walsh, uh, the curator of the Flight Test Museum at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, they were going to open a new exhibit out there uh, celebrating the 60 years since the X2, uh, and he wanted me to bring my model out to put on display, and I explained to him I was getting ready to fly this the uh, third time. And he begged me, he said, you don't seem to understand. You, what you've created is an artifact, and I appreciate uh, the potential risk of that model by you flying it. So he talked me out of it and said if I brought it out to Edwards Air Force Base, he'd make make it all worth worth my while, and he certainly did. This X-2 is right now is sitting on the very place, the run-up pad where the full-size X-2 sat 30 year, 60 years prior. Here's another vantage point from that exact same spot. A couple fun things here. Uh, people may not have realized this is a blockhouse. Every time they flew the X-2, they'd do an engine run on the ground. In 1950s, they didn't have the wireless telemetry like they have now, so everything had to be hardwired for the engineers to record and look at the data. So they were pretty close to this during the firing of the rocket motor. Along those lines, uh, here's another picture. The one on the left is from Life magazine in, in about 1955. Of course, my model's on the right. You can see all the wires and tubes and stuff running into the X-2 so they could do that ground run. Now, the personnel didn't seem to be very concerned about being this close to a rocket motor, especially an experimental one during its firing. And if you see some other pictures of the early firing of the X-2 motor, there are people standing all around this thing. Well, eventually they did realize that's a bad idea. I guess they figured out that heavy embankment and bunker there uh, to protect the rest of the base in case the motor blew up on the X-2 was not a bad idea idea. This is some of my friends from Tripoli, North Texas, Ken Overton, Bobby Newber, myself, Chris Overton, Tony Hewitt on the right. Again, that's the exact same spot where the full-size X-2 had sat uh, some 60 years prior. They did give us a wonderful tour of the base. Uh, one of the highlights was, was standing in the very pit where the uh, full-size X-1 was loaded onto the B-29 prior to Chuck Yeager's historic flight. And then here it is going into the museum. Uh, it lives next to the M2 F2 lifting body in the X4. And a year later, after we took it, uh, that was in 2015. In 2016, they opened this 60th anniversary exhibit of the X2. Uh, Mike Ozer's on the left. Uh, Mel Apt's daughter is in the center, and I'm on the right. Mel Apt was the last one to fly the X2. He was the first person to do Mach 3, but he didn't enjoy that title very long. Shortly after doing Mach 3, he started a high-speed turn, lost control of the X-2, and subsequently got killed. Uh, his daughter here was five years old when that happened. Uh, her younger sister and her mom left Edwards Air Force Base after that, never to return till this date. Uh, so it was great to visit with her and really express to her how important people like her dad were to inspire the next generation of aviators like myself to pursue a career in aviation, really a very special moment. Uh, this is just kind of a fun thing. The picture on the left is uh, some aviation art by aviation art artist Mike Matchett. Uh, this is com commemorating Ivan Kinchel's flight to 126,200 feet on September 7th, 1956. Uh, he was referred to as the first of the spacemen, and of course my model looking very similar to that on the right. So what's next? Well, I don't know, uh, but I sure hope that this presentation inspires you to do something really cool and gives you the confidence uh, that, that uh, you can do something really unusual uh, successfully. All right. Let me close out of this. 
stop the share. All right, let's see here. Question, Bob Capwell, an open rocket to the rocket stability, not an airplane glider scenario. Um, I see that Bob Capwell was asked a question regarding, regarding Barrowman, Roxim, open rocket, uh, the rock, they're for rocket stability, not for aircraft or glider stability. Am I aware of software that does this? And the answer is yes, I am aware of some software that does this. Uh, but I'd be lying to you if I knew uh, what the names of those programs are. Uh, anybody else have any questions of interest or thoughts? In the meantime, you can enjoy my my little humble little uh, model shop back there. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, I have a number of rockets at the top here. Unfortunately, I can't really tilt this thing around too much, uh, but all kinds of fun and interesting things to play with and look at. Anybody else have any other questions? Well, I've enjoyed visiting with you all. I hope that you found this productive, interesting, and I sure hope to see some videos or be at a launch where you've done something really cool. I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast at this time. Please contact me if you have any other questions, thoughts, or problems, and I'd be delighted to help you. Thank you. Ooh, let's see if we have another. Okay. Oh, another quick question here. Uh, before I stop, it says, what software we're using on the slide? Uh, again, that was something developed. Uh, the, the X2, where I was showing the center of gravity limits, was a program developed by Mike uh, that, that, that Mike Ozer got that he further refined to do X2 uh, calculations. Again, Bob, if you contact me directly, I may be able to find out exactly what that software is. All right. Thank you all very much. You have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of your Narcon.